Hello and welcome to Wise Women, the Vicar and the Witch. It's not your usual introduction because it's not your usual episode. Susie isn't going to be available for a few more weeks and I didn't want to just witter on at you on my own. So I thought what I would do is edit into two parts an interview I did with Susie for Unity Online Radio a couple of years ago. It's a really good introduction to all the work she does and I hope you'll enjoy it. What I want to show you tonight is how the weave of the universe, the patterns of the universe, are universal. My particular tradition is based in Judeo-Christian mysticism, but Susie will be talking exactly the same language as me from a completely different point of view. And that is what I love about the way women and mystical traditions work together, because Kabbalistic tradition teaches that the oral tradition is feminine. It's the tradition that is based on the practical application as we live now. And a lot of people have been saying to me recently, I did a service on Sunday for the Methodist Church, and I was being asked afterwards about the divine feminine and the Bible, because I was talking about the first sentence in Genesis, which is, in the beginning, the Elohim created the heavens and the earth. And the Elohim is a feminine noun. So it says quite clearly in the Hebrew, in the beginning, the goddess created the heavens and the earth. And if we study the Hebrew Testament, it takes a lot of studying, I will admit, and that's why we're here to talk to you on the Mystery School about the kind of things that have been researched by scholars. We find that the first temple, the first temple that was destroyed 500 years before the birth of Jesus, had the divine feminine in it. There were two pillars outside the Holy of Holies, one for the masculine and one for the feminine. Offerings of bread were made to the feminine and offerings of wine to the masculine. Now, when the first temple was destroyed 30 years before the Babylonian exile, that's when the rule of law came into Judaism, what became to be known as Pharisaic or Rabbinical Judaism. And the divine feminine was expelled. But you can find her still in the Testament if you know where to look, particularly in the wisdom literature, such as Psalms or the Book of Job or the Song of Songs. And I'm just going to read you a little bit from the end of the book of Job. You probably know about this. This is the story. It's a metaphorical story. But, but the idea is that God tests what he seems to be the perfect human as a challenge to Satan. It's actually an inner journey. It's a metaphysical story about the demons within us that challenge us and which strangle us if we're not careful. But at the very end of it, when Job has taken God into his heart and they're communing with each other and the whole thing turns around, at the end of it, it says that Job was released from his troubles and he had seven sons and three daughters. Now, this is very relevant for the Kabbalistic tree of life, which has 10 sephirot on it, because the seven lower sephirot are the everyday world. And the three top sephirot, the Christian faith would call those trinity, are the divine aspects. And in the book of Job, it's quite clear that the three divine aspects are feminine. The first daughter he named Jemima, which means living in the moment. The second, Keziah, which means empowering breath. And the third, Keren Hapuk, which means the splendor of light. So even in the Old Testament and also in the New Testament, we're talking about that another day, the divine feminine is woven through there. But the feminine has always been associated with the darkness, with the receptivity, with the real down, dark and dirty magic, the giving birth and the dying. So we're going to talk more about that tonight. And we're going to talk about witches because... A woman who is deeply into the divine feminine, who does the feminine work over the generations, has been known as a witch. And of course, that can come up in such a negative way. But in this modern world, we need that old witchcraft. So my guest tonight is a lady who lives probably five or six miles from me here in Dartmoor in Devon in the United Kingdom. So you have two English accents tonight. And she is the Dartmoor witch, Susie Shane, Susie Crockford, the Dartmoor shaman. Welcome, Susie. Hello. Hello. Thank you, Maggie. And are you a witch? 
Oh, most definitely. Um, assuming that you are defining a witch as being a woman utterly in love with our earth and a woman who is in touch with her intuition, which I see that as being fundamental to the definition of the word witch. It's how I define a witch. It's how I define you, too. Can you tell us a bit about your cottage to start with? Because it is such an archetypical witch's cottage, isn't it? <laughs> yes. Um, OK, so my my cottage is um, mostly it was built in Elizabethan times. So we're talking about the 14 late 1400s, 1500s. It's set partly into the wild and beautiful land of Dartmoor. It's made of granite. Um, it's very uh, atmospheric, I suppose, in, in that it's, it's very old. Um, and I love it incredibly. And I remember when you came here, one of the things that you just thought was hilarious, given my uh, sort of spiritual beliefs and the thing I talk about, things I talk about, was that I had both a broomstick and a spinning wheel. Uh, you do room so <laughs> I remember you going oh you're so witchy <laughs> and you have black hair I do and uh, and it's my very own black and slightly gray hair and also bizarrely I've noticed that threads of it are going green which I just think is beyond hilarious given that um the the typical witch is supposed to have a pointy nose, a pointy chin and green hair. And it seems I have a pointy nose, a pointy chin and my hair is going green. OK, so Susie, were you always a witch? I mean, were you a witch from a childhood or did you Definitely. grow into witches? I, I was a witch from a childhood. Um, I remember in primary school, so we're talking about me aged four or five, acquiring the nickname witch. Um, and, you know, I had changed school. I went from my, my sort of little primary school to a, a different primary school where I acquired the nickname Witch. And then I went to secondary school and acquired the nickname Witch. And this was a matter as a child of some significant sadness to me because I, I couldn't, you know, I didn't perceive witches as being necessarily a particularly good thing and clearly the the calling me a witch was not intended as a compliment why and did I they call really you that though understand why um okay. yeah but actually I discovered why recently in I was doing some journeying work within my practice and some some deep work with allowing the sort of the what's what's behind the moment to come up and um, you know, it's the time of year to reflect upon upon witchiness. And I've been writing various blogs about witches and who they are, who they were, why we need them, why our time is now. And suddenly came upon the realization that as a child, I was deeply connected to nature and hadn't, I was very privileged to grow up in a in a family which Whilst it was, you know, all of my relations are Christian, many of them are Roman Catholic, um, but also vast swathes of my family are profoundly and deeply in love with the natural world. And so that was mm. the idea that I might be able to talk to a tree was never told out of me as a child. And so I think I arrived in school as quite an odd child. My my inherent kind of tendencies towards, you know, being spirits and fairies and the spirits of trees and rivers and stones weren't crushed out of me. And so I brought them to school with me. And so I was dubbed a witch very, very swiftly. Now, describe seeing fairies and divas and spirits do you see them with your physical eyes with your inner eye do you hear them are you clairaudient clairsentient or what um as a child i i couldn't have told you the difference between what i saw with my actual eyes and what I witnessed with my inner eye and neither could I tell the difference between what I heard in the material world and clairaudience so for example with that in particular I was often in tremendous trouble as a child for 
purportedly spying or listening at keyholes or, or, you know, shuffling through papers or whatever, because I clearly knew things that I shouldn't know. And it took me years, literally years and years to realize that typically what I hear people say and what they believe themselves to be saying are different. And that I will, and certainly did potentially even more so as a child, I will hear almost the thing they're trying not to say. I'll, I'll hear the truth. And they believe themselves, you know, especially of grown-ups speaking to children, they think that they're terribly clever typically, don't they, and can't, mm. you know, will fob a child off with this or that. But I would hear what they weren't saying as well as what they were saying. And I didn't realise that everyone couldn't hear that. My goodness, you can just perceive from just what you're saying how people would think that was a dangerous thing. Yeah. And is it the same now? It is, but I I now realise that what someone's saying and what they think they're saying and what they're intending me to hear are not necessarily the same thing. And so I've developed a practice of either being very, very quiet or, if I know somebody well enough, feeding back to them, here is what I, I'm hearing you say. Is this right? And it does mean I have some very beautiful and intimate and deep and very honest conversations with people because I'm, I'm hearing all of what you're saying. Typically. And hopefully accepting it. Yeah. Yeah. OK, I'm going to take you off on a tangent now because I don't want to forget this particular bit that I really, really want to talk to you about. When, when I was a child, I didn't have any of these abilities that you have, but I wanted them. It was one of those things that I craved because I had so many magical books by a lady called Elizabeth Googe. She's actually a Christian mystic uh, called The Little White Horse and uh, Linnets and Valerians. And in those, there was this weave of magic with the land that I just craved. It wasn't there in my upbringing but one of the things that always fascinated me from the very beginning was how in all Elizabeth Googe's books people spoke to the bees mm. and how it was so important if you had a hive of bees that you had to tell them what was going on you had to inform them when people came to stay can you tell us a little bit more about that is that your experience absolutely yes um to me, the bees are the single most exquisite and overt illustration of the way in which all of life is interwoven and interconnected. I could, I could speak about this ad infinitum. They, uh, a hive of bees is obviously made up of thousands, hundreds of thousands of what are apparently separate beings. And yet they all exist in a hive, which in many ways could be viewed as being one being because of the way that it um, works together so seamlessly in service to the whole. And then from that hive emanates this extraordinary capacity to go and pollinate, to make fertile our world. And in the fertilizing of our world, to then gather nectars, honey, propolis, <clears throat> um, all these extraordinary nectarous healing um, substances, which we still, you know, science still can't explain. What is it that bees put into honey and how is it that they create it? You know, it's, it's more mystery than it is known still, despite our amazing capacity to investigate things. So the bees are this most beautiful metaphor for the interwovenness of all of life and also for that incredible reciprocity that there is in life, that, you know, what an exquisite thing to, to fly out into the world and go and bury your face in the flowers, kiss them, adore them, and then by going to the next flower to kiss her and adore her, you are ensuring the continuance of life. And then to return from that 
voyage, as if that wasn't good enough in itself, with the blessings of honey, of of propolis, of you know the nectars itself, of of pollen, of all those extraordinary things that we can then gather from the hive. Um, and when I say gather from the hive, I mean in microscopic quantities, because as far as I'm concerned, what the bees offer us is medicine. It is not anything that we should be slathering on our toast in a in a kind of morning, every morning way. The the offerings that a, a honeybee gives us through the surplus of the hive is extraordinary medicine, you know, medicine that can combat things that we've completely been unable to cure any other way like um uh what's that terrible thing when you get um a sort of bacteria or et thing that oh the uh, the, the super bugs that eat, yes, eat your body yes. so so hmm. honey is the one and only thing that has had any efficacious effect in healing super bugs uh, it's just extraordinary stuff. And how much honey does one bee produce in its lifetime? Half a teaspoon. Yes, half a teaspoon. I'm just going to pause on that because we have generally no conception of how little honey one bee produces. And yet we do. We just gorge on it because it's so gorgeous. Uh, I now stopped doing that and I make fruit syrups to use instead in my recipes uh, which is one of the things I've learned to do because of friends here on, on Dartmoor and we, you and I have a mutual friend Anne Garrod who told me this incredible story she's a, a bee shaman and she said she heard of a, a fellow hive owner well you don't own a hive but had a hive in the garden who died and she had to go and tell the bees that the lady who took care of them had died. And the bees, she felt this huge grief and the bees swarmed as she told them. And she had to wait for three or four hours and then go and talk with the bees and explain to them that she would take care of them. And then the bees returned to the hive. And just hearing that to me is magical. Have you had experiences like that? Um, <clears throat> I do. I Yes and no. I mean, I haven't particularly had experiences of telling the bees of death, but but of telling the bees of many things. Yes. And and I do know that there's an exquisite story from some decades ago now, but again, here on Dartmoor, of a wonderful man who was a, a very beloved and well-known beekeeper who um, had a very well-attended funeral in a Dartmoor church. Uh, so well attended that it was actually attended by all of his bees who oh. flew into the church, rose up into the nave of the church, hummed and buzzed and sent their blessings down like crazy and then flew out again. This is just magical, Susie, isn't it? And yet we're so cut off from this. And one of the things that Susie taught me over the years that I've been down here in Dartmoor, because after I came to Dartmoor, I got very sick for a while and I went to see Susie for shamanic journey to try and reconnect aspects of my soul and one of the things you taught me was to spend more time in the darkness I have a bath in the dark now at night and I go out at night and I walk my beautiful two beagles in the night and I am not really sensitive the way you are Susie but I can experience the divas out of the trees in the darkness and mm. this kind of magic is present for all of us isn't it Absolutely. It's our birthright. It's it's not something that that is reserved for the lucky few. It's absolutely our birthright. And, you, you know, you and I were talking before we came online about the enormous disservice that certain aspects of our society have done to our relationship as women to the darkness and to, in particular, our intuition. And it's, you know, intuition is the language of the divine feminine. Uh, intuition is our connection typically with nature and with all that is. And it's that, it's intuition in particular that has been silenced for centuries, feared and ridiculed and called a witch. Because that 
connection that we have to one another, to the bees, to the trees, to the divas, the land, to all of it. That's a pa- our power to, mm. you know, to a great degree. That's where we fund our creativity, our capacity to be potent and powerful. And it was those very capacities that the 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 kind of the toxic masculine that is currently the dominant paradigm sought to crush um through mm. through the church but you know not exclusively through the church through through all kinds of socio-political economic ways in the past because if women are connected through their intuition to the land they're not going to sit down and shut up Mm. We do have to emphasise, and I know you're absolutely with this, this is the feminine and the masculine we're talking about. We're not necessarily talking about men and women, though, of course, oh, I'm women are the ones identified as which is definitely not talking about men and women as the mother of, of three unbelievably wonderful sons and married to a very lovely husband. I'm, I'm not talking about men and I'm not even talking about the masculine as it is housed in specifically men's bodies. I'm talking about the masculine that is present in all of us and the feminine that is present in all of us. And we are, every one of us, an amalgamation and hopefully a balance between those two things. And we are every single one of us who is, you know, alive and well and hopefully thriving, certainly in the West, is partly responsible for that toxic masculinity that is the dominant paradigm, whether we are a woman or a man. That's, I would totally agree with you on that. A Christmas, for example, is a case in point. I know we're just on Halloween at the moment, but after that, we're going to gear up massively for the whole Christmas thing. And I was, uh, in, the, in the sermon at church, I was saying, we have to watch the fact that as women, we go into complete masculine role at Christmas. We buy things, we do things, we sort things, we organise things, we invite people, we work, we do, we do, we do, we do. But in fact, Christmas is about the receiving of the turn of the sun, the return of the sun, however you want to uh, when you want to talk about it, however you want to spell it, it's actually a deep, dark time mm-hmm. at the equinox when we're there at the solstice, where we're meant to receive, when we're meant to put the roots down, when we're meant to rest. And in fact, if we women weren't perhaps as daft as we are doing all the organising with Christmas, I know perfectly well if I didn't do it. In fact, when I was sick, my I couldn't really do it. My husband just went out and got what he could and we had a perfectly lovely day. It wasn't yeah. overdone. It wasn't ridiculous. And we didn't drive ourselves into hysterics over it. <laughs> good (laughs) but would you would you agree that that actually is the masculine aspect of a woman when she just does 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 absolutely yeah to to me the the feminine aspect is is the risk you know the receptive the i think it to me it's most clearly um uh, conveyed if you like by the image of the chalice and the blade the receptive and the active the one who creates the feminine, and the one who protects that creation, the masculine. And we all have that within us, all of us. We have to, you know, even deeply feminine activities, as soon as you apply the word to activity, to something, you're stepping out of the feminine and into the masculine. The masculine is the active. So the, the feminine can create it. The feminine can create, for example, the idea of an exquisite um, patchwork quilt and she might dream it into being, but it is her inner masculine that will get the scissors and cut out the fabric and sew it together. It's an activity. That's a very important definition, Susie, and I think many of us don't realise that. And It's perfectly okay for a woman to be a chief executive of a company. It's absolutely fine for her to do whatever she wants, but as a as a woman, perhaps 51% receptivity, 49% activity. I, I read a statistic earlier that says typically, uh, if you are a kind of, um, what do they call it? Is it cisgen? Um, typically, it's about 70, 30. 
Really? So 50 50, I think personally, 50 50 is where I think we should be aiming because, you know, we need to be activated and we need to be honoring the receptive. Um, and in this time, you know, imagine if all the people in men's bodies and all the people in women's bodies and all the people in bodies who weren't prepared to ascribe the sentence man or woman to their bodies, just all the people in bodies, if we were all truly 50-50 in balance between our masculine and our feminine, for the majority of us, that would be a massive ramp up of the receptive role 